Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Good day, my bed crimers. I hope you guys are all doing really well. To anyone new, a very warm welcome. Thank you for checking me out. If after listening to this video or watching it, you find you enjoyed it or learned something, please do me a favor, hit the like button. It really helps me so much. And also consider subscribing. Now, let's get started. If you're following the case of the four slain University of Idaho students, then you likely already know about the single source male DNA that was found on the leather knife sheath button. You may recall that the sheath was found next to victim Maddie Mogan's body on her bed inside her third floor bedroom. Seems like a lot of people are confused about that DNA. The authorities have said it was single source male DNA, meaning there was only DNA from one person on the button snap and that person is a male. When the police focused in on Koberger as their suspect for this crime, they began following him and his father in his white Elantra as the duo drove toward the East Coast. The FBI, from what retired special agents are saying, typically track people from the sky. I did a little research on this topic, and according to an article in the Associated Press, the FBI operates a fleet of undercover planes equipped with video cameras, some of which can also gather cell phone data. So they can fly over the highway a person is driving on and keep an eye on the vehicle and also keep track of that person's cell phone if it's on, if it's not in airplane mode, and apparently, the FBI do not need to get a warrant, in most cases, to track a suspect in this manner. Thus, the FBI agents most likely were not in a car trailing Koberger's white Elantra. But that said, I'm fairly certain that they were behind at least one of the two traffic stops in Indiana where Koberger was pulled over. I know they've denied this, but I think that they really did. And I think it was the first traffic stop when a sheriff's vehicle pulled Koberger over and the officer told Brian that he was following a truck too closely. One of the first questions the officer asked Brian Koberger was where he and his passenger were headed. I don't think that was a coincidence. I believe law enforcement at that point had no idea where Koberger was going. For all they knew, he could have been trying to flee. What is very telling about that encounter is that Brian immediately responded by saying they were going for Thai food. That was a silly response. We all know what the officer was asking. He wanted to know Koberger's final destination, not where he was going for lunch. And I'm pretty sure Brian Koberger understood the cop's question as well. But I think he likely didn't want to disclose that he was going to his parents' home in Pennsylvania. He was a criminology student, and even if he made mistakes in allegedly committing this crime, he would still have known at that point that it would be better for him if the cops didn't know where he was going. Law enforcement knowing he was heading to his parents' house meant that they could keep an eye on him during his vacation. Many profilers I've watched on YouTube said that the perpetrator was most likely reading and watching everything he could about the case after he committed the crime. And there was that one Facebook comment posted on November 30th of 2022 by someone named Papa Roger, who many believe was Brian Koberger. That message contained this sentence, and I quote, This leads me to believe 
they found the sheath, end quote. The police did not release the information about the leather sheath being found until January 5th, six days after Koberger was arrested. He most likely got concerned after being pulled over twice in quick succession in Indiana. I think if he is the perpetrator of this crime, that he suspected at that point that the authorities might be on his trail and that they might even have found some evidence, perhaps DNA on the sheath that was left at the crime scene. He might have had thoughts racing through his head at that moment like, oh my God, they know it was my Elantra in the gas station video footage, or oh my God, they found my DNA on the sheath even though I wiped it down really well. His face during that traffic stop definitely was the face of a freaked out person, in my opinion. Brian's father, who I really don't think knew anything about his son's potential involvement in this crime back then, upon hearing his son reply that they were going for Thai food, immediately jumped in to tell the officer the information that the officer really wanted. Michael tells the officer they're coming from WSU, Washington State University, and they're going to Pennsylvania to the Poconos Mountains. Mr. Koberger had nothing to hide, and so he freely offered up their final destination. Brian, on the other hand, was not quick to offer up the final destination, and I could swear that he looked a tad miffed at that moment when his father told the cop that they were headed to Pennsylvania. Michael Kohlberger then says this to the officer, and I quote, We're slightly punchy because we've been driving for hours, end quote. I think Mr. Kohlberger felt like he had to give the officer an excuse for his son's silly Thai food response, as in, my son's a little punchy because he's been driving for hours and hours. For Brian Koberger, having his final destination leaked maybe meant having to make sure from that point forward that he didn't leave any items with his DNA on them in the trash anywhere along the route to Pennsylvania and in the family garbage once he got to Pennsylvania. This would have caused him anxiety, no doubt. And sure enough, Koberger was spotted taking his family's garbage out in Pennsylvania at around 4 a.m. one day. That's very early to take the garbage out when you're on vacation from school at your parents' house. He also happened to be wearing surgical gloves when he did this, and he was seen putting his family's garbage into the neighbor's trash bin. Those actions hint at him taking action to try and keep his DNA out of law enforcement's reach. And that's exactly what ended up happening. Law enforcement saw this weird behavior, went straight over to that neighbor's trash bin, collected Koberger's garbage bag, and then found an item to test. And lo and behold, they found DNA on a discarded item in that garbage that proved to be a 99.998% match to the single source male DNA found on the sheath's button snap. The DNA gleaned from the piece of trash was specifically determined to belong to the biological father of the mystery male whose DNA was on the button snap. So the DNA on the garbage item was Michael Koberger's DNA, and thus the DNA on the button snap belonged to his biological son with a 99.998% match. That's a very powerful link between the mystery DNA to Michael Koberger's DNA. And since Michael Koberger only has one biological son, by process of elimination, that person is Brian Koberger. I hope that clears it up. I felt it was very confusing and I wanted to understand it better too. Now, a lot of people 
are assuming that the single source male DNA on the sheath is touch or tactile DNA. And that would make the most sense, meaning Brian Koberger touched the button snap and left behind some dead skin cells. But guess what? The authorities have not said publicly exactly what type of DNA was found on that snap. It could be from another source of DNA from Brian Koberger, such as his saliva, his blood, or even his sweat. Well-known forensic coroner Joseph Scott Morgan explained it best on his podcast, Body Bags. Take a listen to what he said on a recent episode about this single-source male DNA and whether or not it's touch DNA. By the way, I'll leave a link to Morgan's body bag episode in the description. The DNA that was found was found one spot on that knife sheath. It was a K bar, as we know, I've been talking about for quite some time now, but the sheath DNA was found in one spot on the clip, the snap clip. I'm wondering. Do we know where that DNA came from? Was it blood DNA or is it just skin cell DNA? Uh, hard to say. It, it truly is hard to say and we don't have enough information. We do know that there is a specific linkage to the suspect. And that, that's important, at least at this juncture. We will find out more what the sourcing of that DNA is. There are many people that have openly opined that this is probably going to be touch DNA. And we've talked about touch DNA before on body bags, but just kind of revisit this very, very briefly. We slough thousands and thousands of skin cells. And the reason you slough them is that they're dead. And so the, the DNA strand or that it's just a partial of a strand that's contained within what's referred to as touch DNA. So when you, you find that bit of DNA, uh, you have to go back in the lab and kind of reconstruct the DNA. But it, it was sufficient enough to the task that when they did recover the DNA, they were able to develop a profile. Did you hear Morgan say that we, meaning anyone not in on the investigation, don't have enough information to save that DNA on the button snap is touch DNA. Only the investigators know that right now. Next, Morgan brought up the possibility of there being blood on the sheath, meaning on the leather parts of the sheath. The investigators haven't said anything about that publicly. Morgan believes it's a definite possibility and that it might not be Koberger's blood. Morgan rightly pointed out that the sheath was found on Maddie's bed next to her body. With the messy injuries she and her best friend Kaylee Gonsalves had, we know there was a lot of the red stuff on the bed, on the bedding, soaked into the mattress below. Some of that likely got on to the leather sheath. Morgan went on to explain that if the investigators find additional DNA on the leather parts of the sheath, from unknown sources, they can go back to wherever Koberger may have purchased the weapon, and they can then check the DNA of the person who sold it to him. So investigators can basically backtrack to find who any unknown sources of DNA on that sheath belong to. Morgan pointed out how clothing, say made in China, has been known to still have DNA on it from the workers in China when it arrives here in the U.S. and even when a person puts on that item. And I do recall in the John Benet Ramsey case that when experts examined a pair of underwear worn by John Benet, they found female DNA on it, which was indicative of it being left on the underwear during the manufacturing process when a female worker handled that pair of underwear. During that same Body Bags episode, Morgan talked about it being hard to imagine that an attack of this nature with that weapon would not have resulted in at least one of the victims 
being aware of what was happening and not making a primal scream when the first wound was inflicted. And it is definitely hard to imagine that, say, in Maddie's room, where both Maddie and Kaylee were attacked, that the person who was second in line to be attacked didn't scream out because she was aware of what was going on. Morgan asked, how do you get past that? This is not like a gunshot wound where it's sudden and you might have a quick death. He said in Maddie and Kaylee's case, there would have been pain associated with this attack. There would have been awareness at a very primal level. You would think a scream would have emanated, end quote. And I think that too. Who wouldn't scream out? The perpetrator could not have jabbed at the two girls to silence them both at the exact same time. I would think that would be impossible. Now, I'm wondering if Zana Kurnoto is down on the second floor, maybe heard a scream coming from the third floor. We know she was awake because of her being on the TikTok app and because of the DoorDash delivery. Did she hear a scream and come out of the bedroom to see what the problem was upstairs? Is that how she ran into the perpetrator? I'll leave you with all of that to chew on for now. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories. Hey, did you enjoy this? If so, smash that like button, subscribe to my channel, leave me a comment, and I'll see you next time. Hello. How you doing? How y'all doing today? Good, good. Take a look at your driver's license real quick if I could. See, he's right up on that van, man. He was right up on the back end of that van. Hold you over for tailgating. Is this your car? Okay. Cool. Where are you headed? Well, we coming from WSU. And uh, we're standing early. What's WSU? So we're okay. I, I'm having a hard time hearing you because of the traffic. So you're coming from Washington State University, yeah. and you're going where? Oh, we're going to be going to Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. So we're a little, we're slightly punched because we been driving for hours, hours, days. Hours driving. Okay. And what did you say about some SWAT team thing? Or yeah, thing? there was, yeah, there was, was a mass shooting and everything. We don't where? Know if So y'all work at the university there? I actually do work there. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard about that incident. Just yesterday or? No, this happened this morning. About an hour and a half ago, we're still wrapping it up for investigating. I'm not sure the solution is if they did shoot somebody. I see. And then we don't know about that actually. Well, they were there, they were shooting out of the window or something. Interesting. Wow. Okay. So well, do me a favor and don't follow too close, okay? Oh. All right. Thank you. Appreciate you.